everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about the formation of valid contracts. So let's just get started right away. Um, I want you to think about this. Whenever a contract is being formed and you want to determine whether or not that contract is valid, you need to focus on three things. Um, was there mutual assent? Was there consideration? And was there an absence of defenses that would otherwise prevent enforcement of our contract? So this slideshow is going to go over one and two. Uh, the third thing, the absence of defenses, will be covered in a separate slideshow. So we're really going to focus in on the existence of mutual assent and whether or not there was consideration. I want you to keep in mind as we go through the slideshow that the reason why we're going through this slideshow is we are learning uh, whether or not when we look at a contract if it's valid. So here we go. Mutual sense, first thing we want to talk about. Well, on surface, it's pretty simple. It's the meeting of the minds. It requires both an offer and an acceptance. So if you're going to have mutual assent, you have to have an offer. So let's see here. I'll make an offer. Um, I offer to you, Mary Jones, um, I'm going to make this offer. I would like my grass cut. And if you cut my grass, I'm willing to pay you $100 to cut my grass. So um, that's my basic offer. But because this is the law, it can't be that simple. Is my offer good enough? Well, my offer must be definite and certain, and it must be communicated to the offeree. Now, we do have communication because we can presume that I was talking to Mary at the time. Um, I made that statement. But was my offer definite and certain enough? I said, I want you to cut my grass, and if you cut my grass, I'll give you $100. Well, let's examine it. If you want to have a definite and certain offer, you need to have six things. Now, these six things won't apply to every possible situation, but it's something that you really want to um, look to when you're trying to determine whether or not an offer was valid. Well, that should say the identity of the offeree, offeror, the identity of the parties, in other words. So it's me and it's Mary Jones. So our identity has been there. What's the subject matter? Well, I need my grass cut. What's the price? A hundred bucks. So far, we're doing really well. Here's where we kind of fall into a question. The time of payment and delivery or performance. Well, I never said when I was going to pay her the hundred dollars. Am I going to pay before she cuts my grass or after she cuts my grass? When do I want her to cut my grass? Do I want her to do it today or next week or next month? Or when do I need to have this done? Number five, quantity. Do I want you to just cut my grass the one time for $100? Or do I want you to cut my grass 10 times for $100? I need to be a little bit more definite and certain with my offer. Also, the nature of the work or performance that is required. When I just say I want you to cut my grass, I mean, I think we can all make an assumption of what that is. But what if my expectation is that not only does she cut my grass, but that she has to weed my flower beds? That's not really cutting grass. But if I want that, I need to make sure that that is included in my offer. So you see, it can get a little bit tricky. Even though something sounds good on the surface, it may not quite be definite and certain enough. And communication to the offeree. Communication can be done in a number of different ways. And in my scenario, I said those things to her. I could have done it in writing. It could have been an email. It could have been communicated to her in a number of different ways. Okay, so now let's say I've got this offer out there on the table that I want her to cut my grass. I'm going to offer her $100 to do so. I want her to do it tomorrow, and that $100 covers just one time. Okay? <clears throat> now, um, what if I change my mind? And I don't want Mary Jones to cut my grass. I no longer need my grass cut. Something's come up. How do I terminate my offer? How do I get rid of it? Well, I can simply communicate to her that I've now revoked the offer before she's had an opportunity to accept it. So I can say, you know what, Mary, I've changed my mind. You haven't accepted my offer yet. I'm, 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 I'm taking it off the table. I don't need my grass cut. She can also reject it. She can say, no, I don't want to cut your grass, okay? Also, if it just stays hanging out there for an, an amount of time, um, and that can vary. Um, but let's just say, you know, four or five days goes by. I haven't heard anything from Mary. You know, is it okay for me to go ask somebody else 
um, to cut my grass because I haven't heard anything from Mary. If that's considered a reasonable amount of time, then the table, the, the offer is off the table because time has lapsed. And then a termination by operation of law. Sometimes the law says, well, an offer can only be hanging out there for five days, 10 days, 30 days. Um, and after that time, it's gone. Also, um, there could be, you know, maybe I said, you know, I give you a hundred bucks if you kill my husband. Um, you know, that's not going to be valid anyway, because, uh, that offer is not a valid offer under the law. All right. So some more ways, um, now knowing that I can terminate my offer is all fine and dandy, but there's sometime, sometimes some situations where I cannot revoke my offer. Let's look at those. Number one, if I have entered into an option contract with someone, this is where, I uh, say to somebody, all right, well, you're, you know, you need more, more time to figure out whether or not you want to accept my offer. Well, in order for me to give you that extra 30 days or whatever it is, I need you to give me $500. And that $500 will pay for my inconvenience during that 30 days while I'm waiting for you to make up your mind or to do whatever you're going to do. This is common in the situation where somebody's buying real estate because they're waiting for the bank to tell them whether or not they're going to get the loan. So a lot of times an option contract is done to take that house off the market and so that the seller doesn't entertain um, any other buyers while I'm waiting for my financing to come through. So an option contract is where my ability to revoke my offer would be limited by that option contract. I mean, that's only fair. Now, there's also something called a UCC firm offer. Now, we talked about the UCC um, in another slideshow, and this is uh, where the Uniform Commercial Code regulates transactions between members of the business community. We're looking at merchants, okay? Now, if a firm... Uh, if a merchant makes a firm offer to buy or sell goods and they put that in writing and they offer to hold that open um, for a certain period of time, that cannot be revoked. They have to wait until that time lapses. Even if they haven't stated a period of time, if they've made an offer in writing, then a reasonable time is inferred, and that's not to exceed three months. Again, this is something between businesses. The UCC always applies to transactions and contracts made between businesses merchants. Another way that I might be limited as to how I can revoke my offer is detrimental reliance. This is where um, I say to Mary, um, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you cut my grass, and she says, uh, you know, and I haven't heard back from her, but it's only been a day. Um, and I know that she doesn't have a cell phone and that she probably, if she was going to accept it, was just going to go ahead and start cutting my grass. Um, or maybe she even canceled another opportunity that she had to earn money because she wanted to come to my house and cut my grass. If I'm aware of this in any way, um, then I should expect that she may rely to her detriment upon my offer and take some action. Um, that's called detrimental reliance. And then part performance of a unilateral contract means I cannot rescind that offer. Let's say I know that somebody is, um, I've uh, put a unilateral contract in that. I've put a reward poster up for my dog for a hundred dollar reward if you bring me my dog back. Uh, somebody calls me on my phone and says I'm on your street. I have your dog in my car. I'm looking for your house. I can't find your house. Can you tell me where it is? I'm bringing back your dog so I can collect the one hundred dollar reward. Now this is partial performance. I'm aware of it. I know that this person is trying to bring me my dog. I cannot say to this gentleman on the phone, I've changed my mind. I don't want my dog back. Okay? Um, because he has partially performed on my unilateral contract. So the offer is out there. It's definite and certain. It's been communicated to the offeree. I haven't terminated my offer. Um, whether it's been limited or not by some of those examples on the previous slide, 
now we're at the point where there's going to be an acceptance. Well, how does somebody accept? Well, traditionally, um, if you accepted, uh, if you made the offer verbally, then the acceptance should be verbal. If you made it in writing, then the acceptance should be in writing. Um, so the common law rule says that different, um, uh, that you can accept it in any of those different manners. Now, something I want you to look at is, okay, is it an acceptance or is it a rejection? The common law rule says, if you add different or additional terms in the acceptance, it makes it a rejection and a counteroffer, unless it's clear that the original offer is still being considered. So let's say, for example, in my grass cutting situation, I say to Mary, I want you to cut my grass for $100. She comes back and she says, wow, that sounds really great. For $120, I'll weed for you as well. Okay, so now she added some different or additional terms um, to, the, uh, to my offer. Under common law, Sounds a lot like she rejected my offer of her cutting the grass, and she wants to do it for 120, and she wants to do additional services for me. So that actually could be considered a counter offer, um, unless she made it very clear that the original offer is still being considered. So when she said, "That's great," that hundred cut your grass for a hundred dollars is great. She basically was saying, "Look, I'll do it for a hundred. If you give me a 120, I'll weed for you too." So there's two ways to look at that. And if it was clear that the original offer was still being considered, then we're good. Okay, so that's common law rule. But what do you do if you're merchants? What do you do whenever there are two business businesses and they are working together? There's something called the Battle of the Forms, and it's UCC 2-207. Okay? Um, now... In this case, we have to have consistent terms. Um, if the terms are consistent with the original offer, they become part of the agreement unless the offer award um, says, no, I don't want those consistent terms to be part of the agreement. So does that make sense? Um, so... Let's say, for example, they offer to sell me um, widgets, and I buy green widgets. Um, if they respond and they say, we're going to sell you uh, the green widgets, but we're also going to sell you red widgets. It seems like it's still widgets. They're just different color widgets. If I don't say anything, then... Pretty much the court's going to say, I probably have to accept those red widgets, as long as it doesn't materially alter my agreement. Um, if it wasn't, if color wasn't like a big deal when I originally made my agreement, then it's not going to be a big, huge deal. In order for me to sort of, you know, reject this, this whole contract, I need to say absolutely not. I need to specifically object. Um, if there's inconsistent terms... They do not become part of the contract unless um, the offeror expressly assents to their inclusion. So if you've got a bunch of weird, inconsistent terms, now I'm not just buying widgets, but now they want me to buy, um, you know, like soda cans or something. What the heck? Why am I buying soda cans? That doesn't have anything to do with my original contract. That's very inconsistent. So they, uh, I don't even have to say anything. Those do not become part of the contract unless I expressly assent to their inclusion. I say, you know what, let's do those soda cans too. Now, either party can avoid this entire 2-207 battle of the forms by expressly stating their desire to form a contract that is consistent only with the original terms. Okay, that's the way to avoid the battle of the forms. Okay. So how do you um, communicate your acceptance of an offer? Well, under the common law, as I stated um, on one of the previous slides, um, the offeree must have used an authorized method of communication for acceptance. Um, unless it's otherwise specified, the method used by the offeror to transmit the offer is pretty much, an, it's impliedly authorized that that is a 
perfectly good form of acceptance. So if I email you an offer, you can email me back um, an acceptance. If I text it to you, you can text it back. If I call you and talk to you on the phone, you can call me and talk to me on the phone. Unless I say I want the acceptance in writing. Uh, if I specify something specific, then that's what you have to follow. Otherwise, it's going to be implied that whatever method I used, if it was good enough for me to communicate the offer, it's good enough for you to communicate the acceptance. Under the UCC between merchants, an offer can be accepted by any medium reasonable in the circumstances. So I can make a phone call to you and make the offer and you can fax me back um, an acceptance. The mailbox rule is becoming less and less important as um, fewer and fewer of us are using snail mail as we like to call it now. But acceptance by mail um, it creates a contract at the moment of posting. That's whenever the post office actually stamps that, that red postage mark on there. Um, if it's been properly addressed and stamped, that is when acceptance um, is noted. So you give me an offer and I accept, I write it down, I, I put a stamp, I put it in the envelope, I put a stamp on it, I take it to the post office. The minute that the post office stamps that and it's out of my hands, it is now being delivered to you, even if it takes five days, seven days to get to you, acceptance, uh, the mailbox rule says acceptance is at the time of posting. Okay? Unless the offer stipulates that that type of acceptance is not uh, effective and that they're only going to count it effective once they actually receive that piece of snail mail um, or if you have some kind of an option contract or something. Um, so even now what about if you send it in an unauthorized method like you text response and acceptance. It can actually still be considered effective if it is actually received by the offeror while the offer remains open. So you can make that argument in court. I know I didn't send it in the best possible way, but I sent it and they knew that I was accepting it. Um, if offers cross in the mail, um, they don't create a contract even though they apparently have mutual assent. Um, an offer cannot be accepted until there is knowledge that it's been made. So what does this mean? Well, if I offer um, to uh, pay Mary $100 to cut my grass, and she doesn't know about it yet, and I send it to her in the mail, and at the same day, she just coincidentally mails me a letter that says, you know what, it looks like your grass really needs cut. I'm willing to do it for 100 bucks." And those two things cross each other in the mail, even though they are identical. And it seems like a, a, a contract should have been created. Nobody's accepted because nobody knew that an offer was out there um, from the other party. An acceptance without communication. An offer can expressly waive any communication of acceptance. Um, it can say, you know what, um, your silence means that you've accepted it. Um, so an offeree who silently receives benefits of services will be held to have accepted a contract for them if the offeree had a reasonable opportunity to reject and knew or should have known that the offeror expected to be compensated. See, this is where they get you on some of those um, situations where they're like, hey, it's a free trial and at the end of it, if we don't hear from you, we're going to continue to charge you every month $14.95 um, after you've enjoyed your free trial. Um, okay, so was there consideration? Do we have consideration? All right, let's find out. Okay, consideration is a bargain for exchange between the parties, and it must provide some benefit to the promisor or must provide some detriment to the promisee. I mean, something to be considered um, consideration. It's going to be like, hey, when I pay you money, I feel that I feel that loss in my wallet, and you feel that gain by getting my money. But maybe you had to do something in exchange for that. Maybe you had to do some service or work. Um, but Or maybe you sold me something like your car and now you no longer have your car. Remember, consideration is something like you can feel that. You know um, that you've given up something um, or that you are benefiting in some way. So um, gifts are not consideration. There's no consideration there. Somebody just simply gave you a gift. And the person who's giving you the gift is just giving you the gift because they love you out of the kindness of their heart. Um, you cannot say that consideration is something that I've done for you in the past. You can't say, well, I think you need to pay me $1,000 because 
you know, I took you to the hospital and I took care of you and I nursed you back to health last year. Don't you remember that? You should give me a thousand bucks for that. No, you can't do that. Uh, a contract, that thousand dollars, if you really wanted it, you should have asked for it at the time and before you, before you gave the medical services. Um, not medical, but um, assisting services. Um, moral obligation. You can't say that you have to... Um, help me or you have to do this thing for me because it would be immoral for you not to. That is not considered consideration. Um, now, consideration, um, if it doesn't have any value or if it has little value, it's insufficient. So like $1 um, on something really big is not considered um, consideration. It's too nominal, which means it's too small. You can't consider something consideration if you have a pre-existing legal duty to do something. You can't say, if you give me $100, I'll file my taxes this year. Well, you have a legal obligation to file your taxes anyway, so you really can't get somebody to give you money to do something that you were already legally obligated to do anyway. You're not giving up anything. You're doing something you had to do anyway. Also, if you already owe somebody money, so let's say I owe you $500 and I haven't paid you for a number of years and I want you to come over and clean my house and you say no I'm not gonna come over and clean your house and I'll say look if you clean my house I'll pay you back that $500 I owe you no that's not consideration I already owe you that money it's a pre-existing debt um, and forbearance to sue if I fall in your store and I break my leg okay um, Promising not to sue you if the claim is valid. I have a valid claim against you. It does not constitute consideration. I can't say to you, look, if you come and clean my entire house, I won't sue you for that time I fell in your store. It's not going to work. Consideration must exist on both sides of the contract. It can't just be one of those things where one person feels it and the other person doesn't. Um... So any kind of a requirement and output contract, these things have been found to be enforceable um, and valid where you say something like, I promise to buy all that I need from you. I'll buy all of the, the gasoline that I need. I'm going to buy it from you. Um, or I promise to sell you all of the dolls that I make. I'm going to make these dolls and every single one that I make, I'm going to sell them to you. I don't have a specific quantity in either one of those situations. Um, it's called an outputs contract or a requirement contract. And those are valid. That is considered valid consideration. Um, a conditional promise is not enforceable if the condition is entirely within the promisor's control. So here's an example, and it's in the study guide. Um, let's say, for example, Aunt Mary says to you, um, if you break up with your boyfriend, I will pay for you to go to law school. Now that sounds like a really awful thing for Aunt Mary to do, but you really want to, to get law school paid for, so it is within your control whether or not you date your boyfriend. So you decide to go ahead and break up with your boyfriend, and then Aunt Mary, she has to pay for law school. You gave up something, she gave up money, it's a mutual exchange of uh, consideration. How about this one? Aunt Mary says to you, look, if I lose 10 pounds within the next month, I'll pay for law school for you. Well, whether or not Mary loses 10 pounds is entirely within her control. She can decide to eat and eat and eat because she doesn't want to pay for you to go to law school. So it's entirely within her control. So that's not real. That's not real consideration. Um, so that's a conditional promise that is not enforceable. But generally they are as long as they aren't outside of the promise, as long as they are outside of the promisor's control. Um, now, a right to cancel upon 30 days notice is valid. Um, you can use that as consideration um, because it has a time limit on it. Um, you can, um, valid consideration is found in those voidable promises where you uh, contract with a minor because they can choose to ratify it. Um, unilateral or option contract, option contracts are enforceable and unilateral contracts um, are also enforceable once the performance has started. Um, and a choice of an alternative course 
Um, this is like, I can, I'll either do this or this. If you give me a hundred dollars, I'll either cut your grass or I'll wash your car. So that's where you're promising. You have a several alternative means of performance. Um, unless each alternative involves some legal detriment to the promisor, it's not going to be valid. So you're going to have to analyze those alternative, um, source types of consideration. So can we substitute things for consideration? Um, consideration is, remember, is the bargain for exchange of something. Um, what if I want to use as my consideration instead of money? Um, I say I'm going to give you this promise. I promise to, um, you know, send your youngest son to a private school. Um, and I promise to do that. Now, you don't have a son yet. You don't have any children yet. Um, but I get somebody to notarize that. Under the Uniform Commercial Code, that's not going to be valid. But under common law, that promise that I put in writing under seal that's notarized, that was valid. That was valid consideration. I gave you that promise. Um, a promise in writing is generally not considered uh, valid consideration if I don't get that notarized um, but the UCC does permit that between uh, merchants you know it's I promise to sell you 100 widgets etc promises to pay obligations barred by law um, you have to have something in writing or to have partial performance you know after so long um, a debt is no longer owed you cannot enforce a debt so let's say you know 20 years ago I owed you a thousand dollars but it has long since been written off as bad debt you are no longer le legally obligated to pay it to me but if you say to me you know here's how we're gonna do this thing uh, I know I don't owe you that anymore but I will pay you that I will compensate you for that actually um, if you put that in writing and we have some partial performance, then we can use that as consideration. Um, and then promissory estoppel. You don't need any consideration um, when the promisee has relied to his or her detriment upon the promise of the promissor. That's one of those quasi-contract situations where I thought we had a contract, but we didn't. Um, and then I did something and there was, I, you know, I, I acted to my detriment. And now it'd be really great if I had some compensation for that. Um, now we're going to cover absence of defenses in week three, but just as a quick review of what just happened in the slideshow, which I know is lengthy, we're talking about the validity of contracts. And remember, the first thing that you have to, to look to if your contract is valid is did I have mutual assent? And then number two, did I have consideration? So and then the third thing is, was there an absence of defenses? Now, in the slideshow, we covered those first two. Was there mutual assent? Was there an offer and acceptance and all that stuff that went along with that? And then consideration. Was there a bargain for exchange? And then all of the things that go with that. So it was a lengthy uh, slideshow. However, um, there's a lot of information packed in there. Um, in the next week, we're going to go over absence of defenses. So I want you to have a great day. And as always, if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me.